Ah, welcome home. I've played many games over the years. Most of these come and go, but a few of them actually stick around. These games that survive, I've found to always have one thing in common. Community. Because a game isn't complete without its player. And few things form a community the way competition does. But when competition pushes players to their limits, players will push back into the limits of the game. And what happens when a limit is broken? When glitches are discovered and exploited and new techniques are born? Will the tech transform the game into something beautiful? Or will it be the thing that breaks the game past any point of repair? Today, we're going through some of the spiciest stories of controversial tech in video games. How that tech is executed and what impact the tech had for better and for worse. And where better to start than with the most famous piece of tech ever discovered. Enter the bunny hop. Quake. Came out in 1996. Quake was initially meant to be an arena shooter where you run around a big map fighting other players chasing pickups and dodging rockets. This was in itself a very fast game, but with limits to your character's speed. However, because Quake had the best quality an engine can have, that is, being scuffed, your character's speed cap only applies when you're holding down the forward key. When players realized this, they quickly figured out that this could be exploited. Because if you jump and accelerate in mid-air by moving side to side instead of forward, you can keep building speed forever. The bunny hop had been born. After people figured out the bunny hopping tech, the game was transformed into the first movement shooter. Quake was released during a time when players decided how a game was going to be played, and players were no longer camping the armor pickups. Every player had become an exploding motorcycle, flying through the air, railgun beams crackling as you raced to compete for every pickup on the map. Rating the bunny hop plus momentum. Whee! Plus movement as a skill. The same reason grapple hooks are fun. Minus nightmarish skill ceiling. Minus skill curve? No. Skill Mountain, topped with a ski resort called the Dojo of Pain. Imagine getting cleaned out by an age 30 boomer for 25 frags in a row without you being able to touch him once. If that idea turns you off of trying Quake, then you understand why movement shooters have yet to go mainstream. Because when deep tech like this strikes, it seems to always transform its victim like a vampire. The niche Quake acquired gave it a competitive immortality. But the trade-off is that Quake is doomed to forever forever scare off new players. With Quake, bunny hopping had claimed its first game, and it was about to strike again. Enter Source Hops. Half-Life 1 came out two years later, in 1998. During development, Valve decided to save time and energy by basing the game's Source engine on the Quake engine. Um... That might be a problem. The B-Hop tech carried over, which for the hardcore audience transformed Half-Life 1 into a super ultra fast paced speedrunning game. And luckily, since only 12 people ever played Half-Life 1's multiplayer, controversy never surfaced and everyone lived happily ever after. Right? It's not like Half-Life was about to get a multiplayer mod that would get so popular that it would redefine all of multiplayer gaming. R right? Something something boon. Welcome to Counter-Strike 1.6 and Source. As the B-Hopper's skills grew, players started breaking maps. If you were a newbie who couldn't B-Hop during this time, and you couldn't find any game fact tutorials to read, or video tutorials to like and subscribe to, Go on. The pros of Counter-Strike would beat you in a race to any spot on the map. Which on T means CTs would blast you before you had gotten your pants up. And on CT means the bomb would be planted before you had even gotten to the site. A lot of tier gamers could only ever be matched by other Yahweh tier gamers. Clearly, B-Hopping had bitten another game. And Counter-Strike had been sent to live in Nightmare Difficulty Town together with Quake. But was Valve really about to give up on Counter-Strike and abandon the series to the cheaters and the the sweatiest of the tryhards. Yes. But before that, Valve wanted to make a couple trillion dollars off of skins. So when Counter-Strike Global Offensive dropped in 2012, the game had a compromise. An in-air speed cap was added, which kept B-Hoppers from going past 120% of the max run speed. This meant the pros could still gain an edge by bouncing around on pogo sticks, but let the slow pokes still have a chance to compete. This refined the bunny hop tech into an intentional mechanic, and that's so smart that it can actually be described as dialectical design. 
fine. Yeah, taste on those words. But maybe there are even better solutions to controversial tech. Enter the Super Bounce. Halo 2 dropped in 2004, after only 12 short months of development from Bungie. This resulted in an avalanche of bugs, which hardcore gamists quickly went to work on. Because back then, glitches were known as cool secrets to show your friends. One such secret that was found is client desynchronization, where if you crouch Halo under a small area, then press the button to uncrouch, the game physics would force Halo to stay crouched, while the game engine would take the command normally. This tiny inconsistency in the game's logic means that you just desynchronize yourself. And now that we're in violation of game rules, let's commit a little trolling. While charged with a desync, find the edge of a 3D object, line up where a 3D mesh ends, and then jump directly on top of that edge. That's so fucking cool. Super bouncing is also super useful in speedruns. And since super bouncing in multiplayer was tricky and not really very useful, the tech stayed non-controversial. But the hardcore gamists that were searching for these tech didn't have their hunger sated by finding one. If anything, this just gave them a taste for it. Enter the Swordfly. When your crosshair turns red in Halo 2, any melee attack you do turns into a contextual lunge. This means that Halo will close the gap to connect a melee attack that would otherwise miss. And at some point, some gamers took notice that the crosshair also turns red when you're hovering over an enemy through a scope. And I think you might be seeing where we're going here. That's right. It's poggered time. Here's how we swordfly. Aim at an enemy through a scope to turn your crosshair red. Now listen closely, because you only have about a sixth of a second or less to do this. Immediately switch out your weapon to an energy sword. Press the reload button to cancel and reset your attack animation. Then press the fire button to trigger a contextual lunge. And if you do this fast enough with perfect precision, you will swordfly. And I'm gonna keep it real with you, chief. You may like prop flies or or backward long jumps or whatever, but this? This is the tightest fucking tech in any video game ever made. Pulling this off literally makes your dick grow by three inches. That's real, that's fact. You can use that in the court of law. Oh, but you're asking how this could be used? You're about to find out. Jesus, I think my dick just grew by three inches. What makes this even cooler is that swordflies are the main movement tech in Halo 2 speedruns, which is why Halo 2 is the only game that I and Nissa have ever speedrun. And for single player PvE, this is fucking rad. But wait, hold on. To do a swordfly, we reloaded to cancel an animation. Could this maybe be used for something else? Enter. BXB, BXR, double shots, and quad shots. Reload canceling turned Halo into Street Fighter. Fighter. BXB. Melee. Reload cancel to reset your animation, then do a second melee. BXR. Lunge slap a guy. Reload cancel to reset your cooldown, then instantly fire. Double shot. Fire the battle rifle's first burst. Immediately buffer a second burst, then reload cancel to unleash all six bullets simultaneously. Quad shot. Execute the double shot we just talked about. Do a perfect double switch out reload cancel, then execute another double shot. Pulling off Halo 2's tech is hard. And somehow, this paired beautifully with the game's rock, paper, scissor type design. When Bungie learned of this, they feared that it might wreck their game, just like how bunny hopping wrecked Quake for newcomers. So Bungie wasted no time in making their play. Not a compromise like CSGO, but a statement. All of this tech was banned from Halo 2's competitive play, and officially defined as cheating. But since the tech was left in the game and never patched out, the hardcore players could still go nuts in their own high-level lobbies. Clever play by Bungie, since it may have secured them the best of both worlds. The intended casual appeal remained while creating a new arena for the hardcore. And this brings us to the final boss of early video game tech. Enter Wave Dashing. 
In 2001, Smash Bros. Melee dropped, which is without a doubt the deepest Smash game because of its tech. Multi-shine, L-cancel, short hop, ledge hop, pivot, wall jump. Basically, there's a lot of tech in this game. But to explain why Melee's tech works so well, we only need to learn how to wave dash. In Melee, if you shield in air, you'll trigger an air dodge instead. This air dodge has momentum, and if we trigger an air dodge very close to the ground and aim it diagonally, down towards the stage, the air dodge will shoot you into the ground and slide you across the stage. This is not only a fast and a fun way to move, it has an extremely low recovery time, which lets Vishnu tier gamers chain it into insane combos. This results in Melee being the fastest, most apeshit fighting game out there. So much so that it caused the director of the game's sequel to experience a stroke and ship the sequel with RNG based tripping mechanics mechanics for absolutely no reason. What made Melee controversial is basically that anyone can immediately tell who's good and who's great. And while this is normal for fighting games, Melee was intended as a casual fighting game, and the hardcore gamists were making it look like the most complex fighting game ever made, which, I mean, it might be, although completely on accident. This has led to years of strife between the hardcore Smash players and Nintendo, because they can never agree on how the game should be played. Which is super silly, because if we review all these cases, we quickly learn the answer. Designers can do what they want, but like we said at the start, no game is complete without its player. The moment a developer releases a game, it becomes the community's turn to shape and define the game. It's a give and take relationship, and the game is ultimately owned by both parties. And the best developers roll with the punches and embrace what their community does with their game and get dialectical and work in what the community has discovered. <laughs> Now, this is what I would be saying if the video game industry learned anything from these cases. You may have noticed the release dates of the games in this video, and that they range from the mid-90s to the mid-2000s. In this era, the players had more control. But what happens in the era after that, when new tech is discovered in a game with an already established eSport? Let's find out. But first, I have to share something important. I've made videos and streamed for years, completely for free, just because because I love hanging out with you guys. Last month, I made a subscription model on a whim, just expecting it to stay completely empty. You proved me wrong. Sepums, Bruce, Pumba, and Bartosz. Thank you. The fact that you boys have stuck around since somewhere around 2017, and you're still choosing to support me... I... I got no words. This goes for every single one of you. You mean the world to me. I'm here because you are here. So thank you for being here. Now, my base gentlemen and my lovely ladies, and all the space aliens too, I love you. If you enjoyed this little presentation, you can do me a tiny favor and send it to someone or someplace you love. If not, just subscribe and click here for part two. I would, I would definitely come on a night elf, that's for sure. Only the men though.